my name is uh, Homer Garza. I'm a retired command sergeant major from the United States Army. I uh, enlisted in the United States Army in, in November of 1948 uh, in the Texas National Guard. After serving uh, one training at, uh, at uh, North Camp Hood, Texas in June of 1949, I liked it so well, so when I went back home after that, I enlisted in the United States Army. And I remained in the United States Army until I retired in October of 1973. I took my basic training in Camp Sheffy, Arkansas. And uh, after basic training, I was assigned to Camp Hood, Texas, 2nd Armored Division, where I stayed there until May of 1950. Uh, when I got orders to go to Japan for occupation duty. I didn't serve too much of time in Japan because uh, three days before I got there, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. So all I'd done when I got to Japan, and I was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division, 7th Cavalry Regiment, A Company, all we'd done was get got ready to go to Korea. So we left uh, Japan on the 15th day of, of uh, May of 1948, uh, 1950, and arrived in Korea on the 18th of July of 1950. We made an amphibious landing on the east coast of South Korea. Uh, our mission, is when we got to Korea, was to go to the city of Taejon to help the 34th Infantry Regiment from the 24th Infantry Division that was getting overrun by the North Korean Army. Uh, we didn't go too far. We went up and down the mountains uh, till we arrived uh, in a small village around the 26th of July of 1950. What the village was called? The village uh, at that time, we never knew the names of any village. We just went by hills. It was about 30 some odd years later that I found out that that village was No Gun Re. And uh, when we were at, when we were got to that area where the village was at, we, uh, assembled a reconnaissance patrol and I was selected to be the point man of that patrol. Uh, we went down the hill to the valley where we in went into a couple of what appeared like two railroad tunnels uh, supporting the main uh, rail going east and west so when we arrived at the tunnels there, on the right-hand tunnel was where all the North Korean tanks and artillery track vehicles that came through there, and they had completely run over a lot of the civilians. They were just laying there smashed in the ground when they got run over by the tanks. So we went through the second tunnel, and there had to be at least two or 300 civilians uh, young ladies, uh, old ladies, old men, and little children laying there. A big percentage were already dead. We proceed, on, we proceed on the right side of the railroad to see what, what and what was there because uh, we could hear the North Koreans and the tanks uh, at that point. So we went about 100 yards when all of a sudden on the opposite side of the railroad, one of our recoilless rifles had fired around and we heard the explosion. And right away, we got orders to withdraw, to re return back to our position, because the North Korean company was coming up to capture us. Well, we came back across the same tunnel where all the Koreans were there and proceeded to going up the hill. By that time, the North Korean tanks units and their artillery already had us zeroed in. As we were going up the hill to our foxholes where our CP was at, a lot of our patrol members 
were killed going up. So we got back to the top of the hill to our CP about an uh, hour and a half later. We couldn't move too fast because we had incoming tank rounds and artillery firing at us. That when we got back to the top of the hill, and I report, we reported to the CP, command post of our company, and then we went to our position. And when I got to my foxhole, my buddy was already dead. <laughs> Till about 2 o'clock in the morning, we were finally able to get out of there because we could see the flash from the, from the tank rounds coming at, straight at us. And all we'd done was get deeper down in our foxholes to keep from getting killed. About 2 o'clock in the morning, the order came out to withdraw, and we started going back south. And all we, all we could do was just run as fast as we could. We carried the wounded, but we left the dead behind. Uh, we done that. Uh, we would go maybe three or four miles. By the time we stopped the rest, the North Korean artillery and their tanks were already firing at us. So we kept on going until we got close to the Nacton River, and we finally made it across the river. And as soon as we got across the river, the engineers had already mined and, uh, and set up their dynamites on the bridge. So as soon as we went across, they blew the bridge completely so the North Koreans couldn't come across the, the bridge. We went on down and uh, we bivouacked in an apple archer just outside of the city of Tegu. And we stayed there. Uh, after we got assembled and uh, we set up a line which was called the Pusan Perimeter, the North Koreans were trying to move us into the ocean because at that time we only had uh, three regiments and each regiment only had two battalions. So we were way under strength. By the time we got to Tegu, we had already lost probably 50% of our strength. And uh, the North Korean government gave us 100 South Korean policemen as replacements. They couldn't speak English. We couldn't speak Korean. At that time, the Korean people would speak Japanese. So a lot of our soldiers that had been in Japan for two or three years knew the language. So we got along fairly well with those. The South Koreans later on, about 30 years later, tried to claim that the 7th Cavalry Regiment that I was in uh, was uh, involved in the massacre. Well, they interviewed a few of the soldiers from the 2nd Battalion of our regiment. And we had, uh, we had some people in the regiment at that time that claimed to be heroes, ex-POWs, that were captured, and they never served in the military. And they were the guys that were doing all the talking about the massacre in, in No Gun Ri. But they were not even in Korea at that time when the massacre uh, happened. Because that happened around the, the 20, between the 26th or 28th or 29th of July of 1950, when that happened. And all that was, happened, was done by the North Korean Army. Uh, those people that claimed that were there and saw that and done that were not even in Korea at that time. They just started talking, and, and like I say, some of those people, which we later found out that they were not even, they were not even in the regiment. One of them, one of them even became to be the president of the First Cavalry Division Association, and the Seventh Cavalry Regiment Association as president. That were not even that were not even at all in the regiment at all did not happen. There was none. When I was there in the 20, between the 26th and 29th of July of 1950, all this was already done. And that's as far as we got. We couldn't go any further north or from there. We had to withdraw because we were outnumbered about 21 to 1 by the North Koreans. So uh, 
we had to withdraw and uh, we never got back to af after we advanced in September of 1950 when we started moving north we never did go by no gun rail we went further down towards uh, uh, Seoul and took over Seoul then we then we went across uh, the 38 parallel and went into Pyongyang and then uh, from Pyongyang, our battalion went to the west coast. I don't remember the, the, the name of the city that we were at on the first part of October of 1950. By that time, we had already demolished the North Korean army. We were getting ready to go back to Japan in October of 1950. In fact, we were there when Bob Hope came and put up a, a, a nice show in the city of Pyongyang around the end of October. We had one regiment on the, on the line with the 5th Cavalry Regiment, and then all of a sudden the Chinese came in and massacred a lot of our 5th Cavalry troops there. When they found out that they were fighting the Americans, then the Chinese went back to across the Yellow River. So we regrouped and went back on line and went up north close to the Yellow River and set up a front line from east to west in, in North Korea. Around the, around the end of, uh, of uh, November, around 2 o'clock in the morning, we were invaded by the no Chinese National Army. And, and we were way outnumbered then, so all we could do was to start withdrawing. And we, we went back as far as we could south while the, North, while the Chinese army was coming after us. We didn't have no vehicles, so we were walking and, uh, and running as fast as we could to, get, to keep from getting captured and getting killed by the Chinese. Uh, it was later on that we got back uh, in November and then uh, General MacArthur put the order out that all the troops had to be south of the 38th parallel before Christmas of 1950. And we came back and set again around the, the Necton perimeter. Did you ever get to meet General MacArthur? No, I never met him, but uh, he came up to our regiment and went through the front lines while we were digging in, the, in, the, in our perimeter, yeah. Uh, I was wounded on the 30th day of August of 1950 uh, while we were trying to push the North Koreans across the Yellow River uh, next to the city of Wigwam. Uh, we were taking in a lot of incoming artillery and, and tank fire that uh, we didn't have no helicopters, no medevac, anything like that. So I was carried piggyback by one of my Korean soldiers down to the bottom of the hill to the aid station. From there, we, pr we processed. Do you recall exactly where you wounded? According to the accusation about wounded knee, he was saying that U.S. soldiers and U.S. Army, 1st Cavalry, are you the unit of 1st Cavalry? Yes. Okay, so your unit was 1st Cavalry. And My unit was the 7th Cavalry Regiment. and the tunnel. What do you, how do you explain that? This, this. That's what they're accusing. Yeah, this did not happen in July of 1950. The people that, uh, that say that were there, that done that, they didn't come into Korea till around the end of July or the first part of August, and they landed in Pusan. So they were not even there when this when this happened. Now, I can't say that maybe uh, when we went north in September of 1950, when we started pushing north, that there was some strafing or bombing at that area. But the massacre happened around the end of July of 1950. By North Korean. By a North Korean uh, military, yeah. 
Yeah. Now, I personally, I've never even heard of this massacre. Can you kind of tell me what it was or for other people who may not have heard of it? Well, when the North Koreans invaded South Korea, I, I witnessed later on before I left there, they would kill anybody, women, children. Uh, they would rape the, le the women. They would kill uh, uh, anybody that was walking. Uh, like I say, they got to that village of Nogonri and went through there. They had run over civilians. I don't know what time of the day or night they came through there with their tanks, but you could see the tracks on the ground over the people that were smashed by the tanks. Yeah. How many people were massacred? I would out. say I would say that uh, they were probably pretty close to 300. They were stacked up against the bank of the what they call the tunnel, uh, and some were laying on the ground dead, and there were some little babies still alive. Uh, there were some young boys that were still alive, and some old men and old women that were still alive. Yeah, but. Uh, we, at that time, didn't fire one round at all at any enemy soldiers except for the, the, the rounds that were fired against, against the group that was trying to capture us on the opposite side of the railroad. Yeah. When we got back to our positions in the hill, we never got to fire because we were outnumbered by 21 to 1. Uh, we were uh, outnumbered by, we didn't have no tanks, we didn't have no artillery. Uh, all we had was the small 81 and 60 millimeter mortars. I uh, left Sesebo, Japan, fairly sick, but I didn't want to turn myself in because then I would have to go <laughs> to a hospital in Japan. So after three days out in the ocean, I went to the sick all in the ship. We didn't have no doctors. All we had was corpsmen. And I had a bad case of malaria. So when we got to San Francisco on the 13th day of June, I was in a coma. And did you say that you enlisted or you were drafted? No, I enlisted. You enlisted, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, what was your reaction about the Korean War outbreak? How did your family react to you leaving to go to a country that, I mean, most people hadn't even heard of? They did <laughs> they didn't have no choice. Uh, we were all thrilled that I was going to Japan. My older brother had already been stationed there for two years uh, in Japan. And uh, we didn't get to spend but about 15 days in Japan before we got back on the same ship that I got to Japan in. Took us to Korea. Took, took us to Korea. What was your first impression whenever you well, arrived? Well, where did you land? Right? Did you say Incheon? No, we landed on on the east coast. We were we were transferred from one ship to another ship, and then that took us about five miles from the coast. We went down the rope ladders into landing crafts, and the, and the, the landing crafts took us to. About a hundred yards from the beach, from the coast, uh, we jumped off the landing craft, and we were up in water to about our chest, and then we walked up. Uh, we done the same thing that they did in Normandy in 1945, but the only problem, there was no Korean, no North Koreans shooting at us when we landed there. We didn't encounter the North Koreans till we got actually at the town of what later on I found out it was no gun radio. Yeah. So how were your living conditions as far as, you know, your food, sleeping arrangements? When we arrived in Korea, uh, we had uh, two days rations, two, two boxes of sea rations. And uh, that's all we had for about uh, almost two weeks. Uh, we survived eating corn, uh, rice, and uh, we would uh, get eggs from the Korean civilians, and we would get chickens and eat meat. They had at that time there was a lot of watermelons, and we'd eat watermelons. But we we lived off of what was there until our 
mess sections arrive there and start issuing more sea rations. Did you happen to exchange any letters to your family and friends while you were fighting in Korea? We did. Uh, we used to even use toilet paper to write on. Really? <laughs> we would get <laughs> paper bags and make envelopes. And, and we would get uh, flour and make glue <laughs> and glue them. <laughs> No postage, everything was free. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's what, how we communicate back and forth. So your loved ones are receiving pieces of toilet paper through yeah. the mail with your, <laughs> with your messages. Yeah. <laughs> Do you happen to have any of these letters um, still today? Oh, yeah. Oh, awesome. We'll have to talk more about this in a <laughs> few minutes. Um, how was your relationship with other foreign troops, including the Korean soldiers? Uh, it was real, real good. Uh, our, our 4th Battalion in the regiment was the Greek Army, and we fought side by side. We also, in our other regiment, we had the, the Thailanders, and, the, and I believe the Filipinos were also in the division. Uh, so uh, at many times, uh, we were next to one another fighting. Typical, dangerous, or happiest rewarding memories that you had doing your duty? The happiest one was uh, when they said, you're going home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the most dangerous ones, it was every day. Every day was dangerous. And and what, was, what was the most severe battle that you were engaged in? Uh, I, I would say that... Uh, when we started pushing the North Koreans up north, we got to, we got to go across the Han River on the railroad bridge that was only connected with one rail. And it, uh, it, we crossed that around midnight. And we had to straddle that one rail and push ourselves for about 25 feet before we could get off of that rail uh, to the side of the bridge where we could walk across. The North Koreans were on the other side of the river and they had zeroed in all their weapons to that one spot. That all you could hear and see bullets flying throughout the bridge. It was a real, it's an iron bridge and a lot of the people that were, got killed, they went straight down into the river. And some of them that were slightly wounded that made it across that one rail and were on the bridge laying there wounded. By the time we got to the opposite side and had already pushed the Koreans down the hill, uh, by daylight, we, then we could see how many dead GIs we had there. And uh, we lost quite a few at that battle, yeah. What was the impact of the war and your fight upon your life? How did you feel after you came home from Korea? Happy. <laughs> Relieved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you been back to Korea? No. 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 I, uh, I uh, didn't go back to that part of the world till uh, January of 1968. I went to Vietnam. And I spent a year in the Mekong Delta. I was a, a first sergeant in a uh, barge artillery unit and spent my whole year there. During that time, I lost about 40, about close to 50 of my soldiers wounded, but I only had five w killed. In 2013, we witnessed the 60th anniversary of the armistice, which was signed by China, North Korea, and the UN on July 27, 1953. There is no war in modern history that lasted 60 years after an official ceasefire and the mutual hostility amongst parties involved has continued. What do you think we have to do to put a closure on it and do you support a kind of movement to petition to end the war officially and to replace the armistice with a peace treaty? I would, I would support it, yeah. I would like to see North Korea to become a democratic country as Germany did with the East and West 
can be one country instead of two Koreans here. And do you have an idea of maybe how that could be resolved? Uh, by having some decent people in North Korea. Uh, North Koreans were the most brutal people in the world. Uh, they, uh, they would burn our soldiers. They would uh, cut their tattoos off their bodies. Uh, if they had more than, uh, if less than five prisoners, they wouldn't take them, they would kill them. Uh, they massacre a lot of our soldiers, which the Chinese didn't do. But no, no human being in this world was as brutal as the North Koreans were. What do you think the legacy of the Korean War veterans and the Korean War are? Well, it's getting shorter and shorter. A lot less people. I'll give you one example. Our regiment, the 7th Cavalry Regiment, we started a reunion back in the 80s. We used, every year we meet someplace in the United States. At one time, we would have over 300 members of our regiment. Two months ago, we met in Chicago. <laughs> we had 23. 23 members out of the regiment in that reunion. <laughs> in about uh, six more years, there's not going to be too many of us left. Um, which leads me to this question. Do you feel that it's important for your children and grandchildren and others to know the significance of the Korean War? Oh, yes. Yeah. Very definitely. Um, any messages that you would want to give to younger generations what educate I, them or to give them some insight of the Korean War? What I'd like to do is, uh, is uh, have uh, the opportunity to have books published in the school system to educate the, the kids about the wars that we had been in. We were at a reunion in Portland, Oregon in 19... Uh, in 19 uh, 97 we went to we went to lunch at a big restaurant and a lot of the high school kids during the summer were working as waitress and servers at this restaurant this was graduates they never heard of korea they asked us are you guys from korea i said no we're <laughs> veterans of the Korean War. <laughs> they never heard about the battles that were fought. I go to a lot of the reunions and they mention uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, but they never mention World War II or Korea. Or now they're even getting away from Vietnam. Well, what do you think about the Korean War Veterans Legacy Foundation, what Dr. Han is trying to do? Um, with the interviews and the, the digital memorial and bringing the, you know, um, descendants of Korean War veterans and getting them involved. What do you think about that? We're, we're doing in, in our chapter in, in Central Texas, in Killeen, we have two big Korean associations. The Osan city of, of sister city of, of Killeen and another Korean organization. We work real close with, two, the, with those two organizations. Every function that we participate in, we invite them. In every function that they have, they invite us. Uh, last Saturday, we had 12 of our members that were invited to a function in Austin, Texas by the Austin Korean Association. And they put us a real good show and, uh, and treat us like kings there at, at the convention, yeah. Now, after you returned back home, you received a GI Bill. Did you go back to school, or did you try to further your education? No, I was a young 17-year-old uh, sergeant in the artillery, and all my education at that time in the Army 
you had to do it yourself. I enlisted, uh, I enrolled in the University of Maryland. I got my high school GED through the Army education system. I took uh, college courses. Uh, it's not like it is now that they send you to every school you can go to. Uh, at that time, we didn't have that many schools in the military to further our education. Uh, like I say, I retired from the military 41 years ago this last October, yeah. And it changed a lot since I retired, yeah. Do you have any other further comments or stories written that you would like to share with the audience? No, just keep uh, praying for the soldiers. If it wasn't for the soldiers, there wouldn't be a United States of America. And if it wasn't for the soldiers, Korea would be one country and it would be a communist country. <laughs>